And there's a whole body of students that need a lot of remedial work to bring them up to, st- bring them up to speed. That's been an increasing difficulty in the classroom. Wow. Mm-hmm. Any way to sort them out and like have a remedial biology class for those who need it? That's that's a problem. Because <laughs> uh, I know some universities sometimes are doing that with other basic skills, yeah. like where high schools are giving them students who don't have basic reading and writing skills, so they just they get them up to speed. And maybe we need to do the same thing in science. Well, yeah, it's it would be a nice thing to be able to do, but the, the way the edu- the biological curriculum right now is packed to the gills and overflowing, we have got to cram so much stuff into those, you know, that magic limit of four years, mm-hmm. you can't tell parents, well, if you send your son here, they will graduate in five years because mm-hmm. they'll, they'll just be adding up the dollar signs. Mm-hmm. So we, we've got to get it done in four years. And doing things like taking a student aside and saying, you know what, you're not ready for our first year curriculum. You've got to get this background done. Nobody would like that at all. We would, mm-hmm. uh, you know, public school teachers get the angry parents coming in and yelling at them about, don't teach them sex ed or don't teach them evolution. Uh, we get angry parents coming and yelling, you're costing me tuition money. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's a pretty effective argument. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah, well. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to squeeze a remedial course in there. I mean, every, every once in a while I've done it. I've, I've managed to talk a student into saying, you know, you've got a choice. You can either go back and get some remedial work done and get the background so that your grades don't suck, mm-hmm. or you can charge ahead and get, C's and D's and forget about getting into medical school. Right. When you frame so, it like that, yeah. that, that, that kind of puts things into perspective for oh, them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. An, an extra year of undergraduate education is a lot cheaper than med school. Mm-hmm. What about not accepting these kids? To say, you're, you're coming from this school? Sorry, we're not even going to look at your application. Yeah. That even, that, that's probably not practical or feasible, but I mean, that would send a message to the lower schools. Hey, we we got to get on board if we want them to go to these uh, yeah, good schools. Yeah. You know, I, 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 go th- I go through this every once in a while where I'm thinking, you know, like right now I'm thinking, let's just write off Louisiana and say, <laughs> forget it. <laughs> you apply to us from the Louisiana school and you're, no, you're not getting in. However, you know, it's not, it's not fair. That the, yeah. the people being victim- victimized are the students. Yeah. That would be compounding the victimization of those students to be telling them that because your teachers have failed you and because your parents are screw-offs and because your politicians are raving lunatics, we're going to inflict a little further punishment on you. Yeah. This, mm-hmm. this is your life. You're going down the tubes right now, and we're flushing the handle. So, yeah, I, you know, I don't want to take that step. So how do you send the message to the schools? That's a tough one. Uh, we, don't w- we don't want to do it by, by punishing the students, first of all. Okay, that's, that's off the table. But on the other hand, you know, we, we can send a fairly objective message that you know, we have standards for admission. You've got to get these kinds of scores on, on your SATs or your ACT exams or whatever. And uh, we, can, we can hammer it home to the high school teachers that if they don't have X, Y, and Z, they're not going to perform well enough to get into our school. And then they'll just say, well, then we'll send them off to Bible school or something. Right. But, you know, um, well, who controls the, um, the SAT test, like those, that level of testing? Because could this actually one day affect those tests? Maybe they'll, they'll ask questions that aren't even up to standards anymore. No, standardized testing is, is, is kind of a mess as it is, that what you often find is uh, the things you need to know to do well on a standardized test like the SATs or the MCATs or whatever are tens of thousands of little facts, facts piled in facts piled in facts. Uh, so they're, they're not really testing general knowledge very well at all. Uh, you can have a student who is a creationist. I've actually had students like this who don't accept evolution at all and believe in a 6,000-year-old Earth. And they're able to go through the, the MCAT you know, practice books and get their scores up and get into medical school. Right. Yeah. Let me ask you about, you bring up the fact that you've had creationist students, and there's, there is a bit of a controversy, mainly in, in the blogs that we, the various blogs, about whether or not students can and should be graded on what they believe as opposed to what they know. Where, where do you fall on that debate? You, you can't test them on what they believe, and you can't demand that they believe something. That's, uh, no, that's, that's unethical, and it's impractical for another mm-hmm. thing. What I try to do in my classroom is, well, first of all, the first day of class is I have, I have to have this little disclaimer. I actually stand up there for 10 minutes and explain to them that if they go on the web and look up my name, they, they might be horrified to discover that I'm this raving liberal 
godless, horrible human being, then I have to tell them that, no, you're not going to be graded on your adherence to atheism and so forth. But what I try to do in the classroom then is try to foster an atmosphere where they can feel free to ask questions. Mm -hmm. If you've got a creationist in the classroom, you know, you, you don't you don't slap them around. You don't tell them that's a stupid question. Go sit down in the back or anything like that. You, you, you encourage them to ask these questions, and then you answer them. Mm-hmm. I think that's the that's the only way right. to do it is is drag them out of the darkness and into right. the light and have them ask these questions so that you can actually address the issues that are troubling them. Uh, you, you don't you know I don't expect to persuade any of them. Have you? Actually, well, yeah, I have, but <laughs> you know it's. Uh, it's not like I get these instant conversions where they say, oh, well, I'm an atheist now. and I No, it's nothing like that. But it's like, okay, I can understand the evidence now, and mm-hmm. I right. will accept that interpretation of the evidence, at least for the purposes of the class and so forth. So, you know, at least they know that it's not, it, that, that we, don't, we don't push evolution on them because it's the evil atheist conspiracy saying, mm-hmm. we've got this doctrine you have to adhere to. No, it's... This is the logical conclusion from a whole lot of evidence that we give them in class. So, for instance, in, in my uh, introductory biology class, you know, I, I took this big step this year. One of the one of the books I use is Mark Isaac's book, The Counter Creationism Handbook. Yeah, I don't know if you know that book. It's you've got to you've got to get it if you're ever dealing with creationists. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's there's a Talk Origins page that's that's a bunch of you know uh, what what is it called. Well, if you go on a talk origins, you can't miss it. It's, it's, a, it's this page. It's a whole bunch of creationist fallacies with the answers. And this has now been published in this nice, thick book. Mm-hmm. Nice. And it's the most useful tool I've got for dealing with creationists because it covers everything. You know, I'm, I'm a biologist, so I don't know much geology. I don't know much astrophysics, et cetera. But when I get into a debate with a creationist, this is the common tactic is you start arguing about Genetics, for instance, and then you just, they just go, oh, well, he teaches genetics. Well, then I'll switch to right. uh-huh. geology, and they'll start, start hammering it. But then you can plot this book, and you can flip to the section on geology. And really, creationists are the most unoriginal people on the planet. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. You look at what they're saying, and it's the same old stuff over and over. And so all the answers are right there. Mm-hmm. And it, and it gets very intimidating to them after a while that you know you keep on flipping this this magic book and there's mm-hmm. there's this reply with citations and all this kind of stuff and uh, the best situation is when you when they when they give up and they say okay can I have the book <laughs> <laughs> yeah and they sit there yeah. thumbing through it and discover that mm-hmm. wow we really have got that covered uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, PZ, thank you so much for sitting with us. We're all looking forward to your presentation, and maybe we'll get a chance to talk to you again a little bit later. Yes, be happy to. Thanks, PZ. Thanks, PZ. Okay. Thanks.